cars and new supersonic fighters surprised the half million onlookers at Toshino Airfield. The moment everything changed. In 1959, at the Tushino Air Show near Moscow, Western military attaches and aviation journalists witnessed something that defied their every expectation. The sleek delta-winged fighter that screamed across the sky wasn't just another Soviet aircraft, it was the MiG-21, and buried within its fuselage was an engine that would soon rewrite the rules of jet propulsion. Though its designation, the R-13-300, wouldn't be known to the West for years to come. As the pilot advanced the throttle, the engine responded with a distinctive howl that would soon echo across battlefields from Vietnam to the Middle East. The afterburner lit with a blue-white flame that seemed impossibly long, impossibly bright against the gray Moscow sky. This wasn't merely another turbojet, it was Soviet engineering philosophy given physical form, a machine that sacrificed everything conventional wisdom held sacred for one thing, pure, uncompromising performance at a price any nation could afford. The engine that would eventually be revealed as the R-13-300 represented a radical departure from Western design principles, embracing simplicity where others chose complexity, choosing raw power where others sought refinement. The gathered observers could only guess at the specifications of what they were seeing, unaware that this engine would eventually power more supersonic fighters than any other single jet engine design in history. What made this moment truly revolutionary wasn't just the technology on display, it was the philosophy behind it. While Western engineers pursued ever greater complexity in their quest for performance, the Soviets had chosen a different path entirely. The Cold War Crucible. Western jet engines of the late 1950s were like Swiss watches, intricate masterpieces of engineering precision built on centuries of industrial tradition. The Rolls-Royce Avon powering Britain's lightning interceptors featured sophisticated multi-stage axial compressors. The General Electric J79, America's premier fighter engine, utilized variable stator vanes and advanced metallurgy to achieve its impressive performance. These were engines that demanded respect, careful maintenance, and highly trained technicians. They were powerful, yes, but also complex, expensive, and unforgiving of neglect or imperfect conditions. Then the Soviet Union arrived with a philosophy forged in the crucible of different realities. Where Western engineers added stages for incremental efficiency gains, Soviet designers removed them for manufacturing simplicity. Where NATO sought theoretical perfection in controlled environments, the Warsaw Pact sought practical sufficiency in the harsh realities of dispersed airfields and conscript mechanics. This wasn't merely a different approach, it was an entirely different conception of what a military jet engine should be. Sergei Konstantinovich Tumansky watched this technological chess match unfold from his design bureau in Moscow, OKB-300, later known as the Soyuz plant. Born in 1901 in Minsk, Tumansky wasn't just another Soviet engineer. A former student of the legendary Vladimir Klimov, he had spent the immediate post-war years meticulously reverse-engineering the Junkers Jumo 004 and BMW 003 engines captured from the Germans. This experience taught him something crucial. Complexity wasn't always strength. The German engines, marvels of engineering though they were, had proven fragile and temperamental in Soviet hands. By 1956, Tumansky had taken leadership of the Bureau and inherited the task of creating an engine for the next generation of Soviet fighters. The MiG-19's Mikulin AM-5 had proven adequate but uninspiring, prone to compressor stalls and lacking the growth potential needed for truly supersonic flight. Tumansky asked the question that would define not just his legacy, but an entire philosophy of propulsion. What if we designed an engine that any factory could build, any mechanic could maintain, and any pilot could push to its absolute limits without sophisticated support infrastructure? Love history as much as we do? Subscribe to our channel, The Path Through Failure. The Tumansky Design Bureau's journey to the R-13 began with the R-11, a design that taught valuable lessons through spectacular failures. Early prototypes tested at the Zhukovsky Flight Test Center between 1956 and 1958 suffered from chronic instability that would have ended careers in the West. Test pilots reported that the prototypes would surge without warning, the compressor stalling catastrophically at high angles of attack or during rapid throttle movements. Vladimir Nefyodov, one of the test pilots, described it as riding a wild horse that's constantly trying to throw you off. You never knew when it would decide to quit. The fundamental challenge was achieving stable combustion across the entire flight envelope while maintaining the simplicity Tomansky demanded. His team, which included Viktor Chepkin and Alexander Sarkasov, many of them former aircraft mechanics who'd earned engineering degrees through night school, approached problems with practical solutions where others might seek theoretical elegance. 
The combustion chamber design went through 17 major iterations before achieving acceptable stability. Each failure taught them something new about the delicate balance between simplicity and functionality. Critics within the Soviet aerospace establishment, particularly at the competing Mikulin and Lyulka design bureaus, dismissed Tumansky's approach as tractor technology, too crude for a modern fighter. The Central Institute of Aviation Motors, CIAM, questioned whether his philosophy could ever achieve the reliability needed for military service. A leaked report from 1957 stated that the design violated established principles of turbojet development. But here's where the story takes its first unexpected turn. Tomansky's team discovered that by accepting what Western engineers would consider unacceptable compromises, higher fuel consumption, lower compression ratios, shorter overhaul intervals, they could achieve remarkable stability across a wider flight envelope than anyone thought possible. The breakthrough came when they realized that Soviet operational doctrine didn't require eight-hour patrol missions or transcontinental range. Soviet fighters needed to get high, get fast, and fight for perhaps 30 minutes. Everything else was secondary. The R-11F-300, which first flew in 1958, validated this philosophy. While it consumed fuel at rates that horrified Western observers, nearly twice that of comparable American engines at military power, it delivered thrust-to-weight ratios that seemed impossible. More importantly, it did so reliably, even when maintained by conscripts with basic training using improvised tools. The secret weapon revealed. The R-13300, developed from the R-11F2S300 between 1958 and 1961, represented the ultimate evolution of Tumansky's philosophy. The decision that changed everything was radical in its conservatism. A two-spool design with just three stages in the low-pressure compressor and five in the high-pressure section. To put this in perspective, the contemporary Pratt and Whitney J75 used 15 compressor stages to achieve similar pressure ratios. Western engineers viewing captured examples years later couldn't believe such a simple design could achieve the reported performance. The engineering philosophy was explicit and uncompromising. The team valued thrust to weight ratio above all other considerations. Where the General Electric J79 achieved its 17,000 pounds of afterburning thrust through 11 compressor stages, variable geometry, and sophisticated materials, the R13300 achieved 13,200 pounds through brute force and elegant simplicity. The entire engine weighed just 1,135 kilograms, giving it one of the best thrust-to-weight ratios of its era. The combustion chamber design was revolutionary precisely because it wasn't revolutionary at all. Rather than pursuing advanced annular designs or sophisticated fuel injection systems, Tomansky's team used a simple can-type arrangement with mechanical fuel control. The afterburner, often the most complex component in Western engines, used a simple spray bar system that could be manufactured by any facility capable of producing agricultural equipment. Here's where the shocking truth emerges. For years, the Soviets lied about the actual capabilities and even the existence of specific engine variants. Western intelligence spent the early 1960s believing the MiG-21 was powered by an upgraded R-11, unaware that the R-13300 was an entirely different engine. Soviet disinformation deliberately obscured production numbers, thrust ratings, and technical specifications. CIA estimates from 1963 suggested the engine produced no more than 11,000 pounds of thrust. The reality was that production R-13300s were already exceeding 13,000 pounds, with a later variance approaching 14,000 pounds in emergency power settings. The engine's acceleration capabilities defied Western understanding of turbojet physics. It could go from idle to full afterburner in less than four seconds, compared to nearly seven seconds for the J-79. This wasn't achieved through sophisticated control systems, but through accepting higher turbine temperatures and shorter component life. Where Western engines were designed for 1,000-hour overhaul intervals, the R-13300 initially required major maintenance every 100 to 150 hours. But when an engine could be swapped in four hours by a team of three conscripts, did longevity really matter? Thunder over three continents. The R-13300's combat debut came not in Soviet service, but in the skies over Vietnam. North Vietnamese pilots, trained in the Soviet Union but flying in conditions no Soviet test pilot had experienced, discovered that the engine's simplicity made it ideally suited for tropical combat conditions. The humid, monsoon-swept airfields of North Vietnam, with their corrugated steel shelters and minimal maintenance facilities, would have been death sentences for sophisticated Western engines. The R-13300 thrived. By 1965, production lines at factory number, 24 in Samara and factory number. 26 in Ufa were producing R-13300s at rates that stunned even Soviet planners. Monthly production exceeded 100 units by 1966, 
with simplified manufacturing processes that allowed semi-skilled workers to produce components previously requiring master machinists. The engine transformed the MiG-21 from a limited interceptor into what Indian Air Force Marshal Arjan Singh would later call the People's Supersonic Fighter. Performance in actual combat conditions exceeded even Tomansky's optimistic projections. The engine could maintain near maximum thrust at altitudes where the thinner air caused Western engines to struggle. At 50,000 feet, where most fighters of the era became sluggish, the MiG-21 with its R-13-300 could still accelerate and maneuver aggressively. The engine's tolerance for disturbed airflow meant it could maintain power during violent maneuvers that would cause compressor stalls in more sophisticated designs. Love aviation as much as we do? Like this video and click that brand new hype button. Combat Proven Reality The 1967 Six-Day War provided the first major combat test against Western equipment in Middle Eastern conditions. The desert environment, with its extreme temperature variations and sand-laden air, created new challenges. Israeli pilots flying Dassault Mirages with sophisticated Snecma Atar 9C engines found themselves facing an opponent that seemed immune to the conditions that degraded their own performance. Sand ingestion that would destroy an Atar's carefully balanced compressor blades merely eroded the R-13300's more robust components gradually. Egyptian maintenance crews, many with only basic technical training, could perform engine changes in open desert conditions using equipment that wouldn't have seemed out of place in a truck repair shop. The engine's magnetic chip detectors, simple devices that collected metal particles from the oil system, provided early warning of problems without sophisticated monitoring equipment. When problems did occur, the modular design meant entire sections could be swapped rather than requiring complex repairs. The Indo-Pakistani War of 1971 showcased the engine's strategic impact. Pakistan's F-104 starfighters, with their sophisticated J-79 engines, required extensive ground support and pristine runways. India's MiG-21s with R-13-300s operated from highway strips and improvised airfields, maintained by crews working with basic tools. The ability to generate more sorties from dispersed locations proved more valuable than pure aircraft performance. The numbers game. By 1970, production statistics revealed the true scale of Tomansky's achievement. Over 3,000 R-13-300 engines had been manufactured, with licensed production beginning in India and negotiations underway with China. The cost per engine, approximately 270,000 rubles in 1970, was less than one-third that of comparable Western engines. This wasn't just about building a cheaper engine, it was about democratizing supersonic flight. The Soviet Union's export strategy leveraged the R-13-300 simplicity brilliantly. Training packages for foreign operators focused on practical maintenance rather than theoretical understanding. A Syrian mechanic didn't need to understand thermodynamic cycles. He needed to know which gauges to watch and which components to replace. The engine's diagnostic needs were simple. Oil pressure, exhaust gas temperature, and turbine speed. Everything else was secondary. In Vietnamese service, crew chiefs developed field modifications that would have horrified Tomansky's engineers, but worked perfectly. Improvised air filters made from recovered American helicopter parts, fuel controls adjusted with bicycle cables, afterburner nozzles repaired with welding techniques learned from repairing farm equipment, all of these kept R-13-300s operational under impossible conditions. Global proliferation. India's relationship with the R-13-300 evolved from customer to creator. Hindustan Aeronautics Limited didn't just license produce the engine, they reimagined it. Starting in 1967, Indian engineers at the Koraput facility began modifying the design for local conditions and capabilities. The Indian-produced R-13-300S incorporated improved materials in hot sections achieving longer service lives than the original Soviet versions. By 1975, HAL was producing engines that exceeded original Soviet specifications, proving that Tomansky's simple design had untapped potential. The technology transfer wasn't just about engines, it was about industrial philosophy. Countries that adopted the R-13-300 learned to value pragmatism over perfection. Egyptian engineers at the Arab Organization for Industrialization developed local manufacturing capabilities for consumable components. Yugoslavia's SOKO plant created hybrid maintenance procedures combining Soviet pragmatism with Western quality control. The engine became a technological lingua franca, understood from Havana to Hanoi. Technical adaptation flourished across three continents. Polish technicians at the military aircraft repair plant number no. five discovered that modified agricultural pump components could replace certain fuel system parts, reducing dependence on Soviet supplies. 
Cuban mechanics at San Antonio de los Baños Air Base learned to manufacture replacement compressor blades using alloys originally designed for sugar mill equipment. These weren't desperate improvisations. They were logical extensions of Tomansky's philosophy that function mattered more than form. In North Korea, engineers pushed the R-13300 beyond its design limits, accepting even shorter overhaul intervals in exchange for higher thrust settings. Their modified engines, designation unknown to Western intelligence, reportedly achieved thrust levels 10% higher than standard variants, though at the cost of service lives measured in dozens rather than hundreds of hours. For a nation that viewed its aircraft as single-use weapon systems, this trade-off made perfect sense, the sunset of simplicity. The 1970s brought changes that even Tomansky's pragmatism couldn't address. Fourth-generation fighters demanded capabilities that no amount of modification could provide to the R-13300. Variable cycle operation, sophisticated electronic controls, and multi-mode capabilities became requirements rather than luxuries. The MiG-23's R-29 engine, Tomansky's attempt to bridge old and new philosophies, proved that some compromises went too far. Digital engine control systems introduced on Western fighters in the mid-1970s offered capabilities that mechanical systems simply couldn't match. The ability to optimize performance across the entire flight envelope, automatically preventing surges and stalls while maximizing efficiency, made the R-13300's mechanical simplicity seem antiquated. The brutal honesty that had been its strength became a limitation, like bringing a sledgehammer to perform surgery. Environmental concerns added new pressures. The R-13300's fuel consumption, over 2.5 kilograms per kilogram force hour at full afterburner, became economically unsustainable, as oil prices quadrupled during the 1973 crisis. NATO exercises calculated that a squadron of F-4 Phantoms consumed less fuel in a week of operations than a similar unit of MiG-21s, despite the Phantom being a much larger aircraft. For nations suddenly facing hard currency shortages, operational costs mattered more than purchase price. Production of new R-13300s ended in the Soviet Union in 1985, though licensed production continued in India until 1987. The last engines rolled off production lines not with ceremony but with quiet efficiency as factories retooled for the AL-31F and other engines of the fourth generation. Yet even as production ended, Thousands of R-13300s continued flying, maintained by crews who understood them better than Tomansky himself might have. Phoenix from the Ashes The post-Cold War era transformed surviving R-13300s from weapons into artifacts, yet their story was far from over. By the 2000s, private collectors and aviation museums discovered that operational R-13300s were more common than operational Rolls-Royce Avons or early J-70s 9s. The engine's simplicity, once derided as crude, now meant that restoration was possible with basic machine shop capabilities. China's efforts to develop indigenous jet engine capabilities began with meticulous reverse engineering of the R-13300. The Liang WP-13, first tested in 1984 but perfected only in the 2000s, incorporated modern materials like single crystal turbine blades and thermal barrier coatings, while maintaining Tomansky's basic architecture. The result was an engine producing 14,000 pounds of thrust with improved fuel efficiency and doubled service life. The Chinese proved what Tomansky had always suspected. His simple design had room for growth that complex Western engines lacked. Modern incarnations used technologies Tomansky couldn't have imagined. Digital control systems optimized the basic mechanical design, ceramic matrix composites replaced steel in hot sections, and additive manufacturing produces components with geometries impossible in Tomansky's era. Yet the core philosophy remains unchanged. Make it simple enough that it always works, powerful enough that it always wins, and cheap enough that everyone can afford it. The philosophical lineage extends beyond direct derivatives. Modern Russian engines like the RD-33 and even the advanced Item 30 for the Su-57 incorporate lessons learned from the R-13300. The emphasis on maintainability in austere conditions, the acceptance of shorter service lives in exchange for higher performance, the focus on manufacturing simplicity, all echo Tomansky's original vision. When Russian engineers designed engines for export fighters in the 2010s, they asked themselves, what would Tomansky do?